Right. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Piotr. Uh, and um, I'd like to welcome you all to, to our next webinar, um, which is uh, called Ooh La La Sexy Grammar. Right. Uh, maybe, maybe it was the title that uh, drew your attention. Uh, maybe it was grammar uh, uh, that uh, motivated you to participate in it. Uh, who knows? But uh, first, let me tell you a, a few uh, uh, words about uh, my way of uh, thinking about, about today's event um, and my choice of words in here. Of course, um, uh, the word sexy, you know, it has two meanings. Um, uh, and today we are interested in the second one. So um, uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you. But uh, we won't be uh, uh, showing any nude explicit material today. Uh, however, uh, we'll be talking about exciting facts about grammar. And uh, one of them will be future forms. Um, I'm not going to go into details right now. Uh, it's just uh, my little agenda for you. So we're going to talk about future forms, uh, grammatical gender, uh, also past tenses, the word if and how it's used uh, in English and also we'll talk about English numerals. So it's uh, it's going to be a little bit of you know a hodgepodge of uh, uh, various grammar uh, aspects and uh, now we're going to talk about future tenses. Right, future tenses. Uh, should, we, uh, should we refer to, to this aspect in such a way? Because um, actually some grammarians um, believe that in English there is no future tense. And what we have in English are only future forms. So uh, let's think about it. No future tenses in English. This is good news for you, isn't it? Right, future forms. Now, it might sound very optimistic, you know, not having any future tense in English, but um, there's something we have to um, we have to all agree on that unfortunately, there are twelve future forms that uh, are there to be learned. So, it's uh, uh, it's not it's not, it's not easy uh, if you think about it. You know, learning twelve future forms uh, it might be uh, a bit daunting uh, if if you if you think about it at first. Um, so what I'd like you to um, what I'd like you to think about now is uh, um, maybe a new way of uh, thinking about grammar. Uh, a new approach to learning grammar. And uh, you might have uh, read about this in our little advertisement for this webinar. This new interesting way of thinking about grammar is using metaphors. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to um, uh, use uh, a very nice, uh, a very vivid grammar metaphor uh, for talking about tenses. In this example, future forms. And the metaphor that we're going, to, uh, we're going to use is the metaphor of a lift. Now, uh, please imagine that you're in a building and uh, this building is called the Future Forms Building. It's um, it's a high building. It's got uh, a, about uh, twelve stories, and uh, in order to to you know uh, get somewhere, you have to use the lift. So now imagine you step into a lift, and in this lift um, there are buttons, you know, which correspond to every floor. So, um, it's a safe, it's a well-known environment, you have nothing to fear, you know what to do. You only have to decide which floor you want to go to. And in our case, those buttons, those floors, will be our future forms. Okay, let's have a look at those. Right, did I say 12? Right, 12 future forms. 
uh, that we have at our disposal in English grammar. Uh, let's have a brief look at them. Um, in the first uh, vertical column, you have four types of will. It's a little bit of a simplification, of course, right? But um, let's let's have it this way: four types of will. All right. In the second column, you've got two types of going to, and there's also present continuous, simple present, future continuous, future perfect. Um, a very nice structure which we can call to be plus infinitive, and future words. All these buttons um, can be um, can be uh, looked upon as uh, ways of expressing future. Now, do you remember? We're in a lift. So, let's press the first button, which is will. Okay, now, let's see what happens uh, if we uh, if we use this button. Now, if we press the first button, will number one, uh, what happens is we uh, we suddenly become able to express spontaneous decisions. Okay, spontaneous decisions uh, about the future. For example, um, person A says, "I'm hungry." And person B says, I'll get you a sandwich, right? Will number one, spontaneous decision, I'll get you a sandwich. Okay, let's move on to the second type of will. We're back in the lift, and now we decide to press will number two. Let's see where it takes us. Right, it takes us to requests. Aha, uh -huh, so we can express requests with will. For example, will you bring me some tea? Okay. Uh, will you print this out for me? Etc. Etc. Right? Requests. Okay. So far, so good. Let's go back to the board, the buttons, and maybe now we decide to press the third type of will. Will number three. Okay, let's see where we go now. The third type of will is used to talk about general future predictions. General future predictions, uh, it's one of the most uh, popular uses of will. Uh, for example, next year we will probably get a pay rise, right? So, um, something very easy. Uh, but as you can see, it's, uh, it's the third type of will, right? We had spontaneous decisions, we had requests, now general future predictions. So these are, you know, completely different, you know, ways of talking about the future. And there's, uh, um, there's one more, and there's one more in the panel here, there's will number four. Now, let's take a look which floor this button takes us to. Right, decisions. Okay, what kind of decisions could these be? Decisions with uh, which are expressed with will. For example, I'll never smoke again, uh, or I'll be uh, a good person next year, or you know something like this. We're talking about decisions. So if you think about it, they all look pretty similar, um, but. Um, they they have their little differences, you know, requests, decisions, spontaneous spontaneous decisions, uh, predicting the future. Okay, so these are the four types of will. Good. Now let's see where going to number one and going to number two will take us. Right, we press going to number one. And the floor at which we arrive is the floor of intentions. Okay, intentions. This is one of the most popular ways of using the going to structure. Um, for example, I'm going to learn how to play chess. Right? Obviously, we are expressing an intention in here. Uh, but there's another going to. Um, there's another button going to number two. 
which is completely, completely, completely different. Now, if we press this button, uh, the floor at which we arrive is the floor of future predictions, uh -huh, which are based on facts. Now, do you remember? We, uh, we talked about will as, uh, uh, as one of the future forms to express predictions, but these were general predictions. Now here, we are talking about predictions which are based on facts. Imagine, um, there's a situation, it's, uh, it's not a nice situation, but you're looking up in the sky and you say this sentence. Just look at that plane, it's going to crash. Or just look at the, that car, you know, it's going to hit this uh, tree. Um, uh, oh, it's getting, you know, uh, you know you're looking at, at your time and say, oh, we're going to be late. So we, we are thinking about future predictions, uh, which, are, uh, which are based on facts. Uh, there's also one more very vivid example uh, of using this um, uh, this future form, uh, uh, you know, as a sentence uh, uh, which mm, can go like, uh, "We're going to have a baby," right? We're going to have a baby. It's um, it's not about intentions here. It's uh, it's a future prediction which is based on a fact, um, a medical fact. You know, um, maybe. Uh, maybe the woman who says this uh, has just had, you know, uh, um, um, a, you know, a, a kind of a, you know, a, a, a test, uh, uh, or you know, um, maybe the person has been to a doctor uh, who, who, uh, who informed her about um, about the happy event. Right? We're going to have a baby. So uh, let's move back, and we're we're back in the lift. Now, um, present continuous. Now, how can present continuous express future, which is different than the the other uh, six forms? Let's press it, and let's see where it takes us. Aha! It takes us to a very important flaw in our building, which is called fixed arrangements. Now, fixed arrangements are different than intentions, different than general future predictions. Uh, they are fixed arrangements, okay? And, sorry, and uh, one of the examples um, could be this. Um, I'm getting married this Saturday. Now, if we, if we communicate such news, it means that, you know, uh, the guests have been informed. Uh, the uh, the registrar in you know the 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 office uh, have been informed as well. Maybe maybe there's a you know a, 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 a priest uh, who who knows about it, etc. 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 So it's a fixed um, it's a fixed arrangement. Okay, um, present continuous, future fixed arrangements. How about simple present? Um, everybody knows this tense. Not everybody knows that it can express future. Right, let's press the button. And what we discover is that simple present is not only used to talk about, uh, you know, things that happen uh, on and on and on and on, some habits, etc., etc. It can also express future. Future, which is sometimes called uh, timetable future. Okay, think about planes, think about trains, think about buses, uh, or you know uh, meetings which are regular. Um, the bus leaves at 4:30. The meeting starts at 5, etc., etc., etc. It's it's a way of talking about the future, isn't it? All right. Um, now we move on to um, two future forms. Um, which, uh, in my understanding, uh, can work uh, as um, little uh, mini time machines. Okay, so let's press uh, the button which is called Future Continuous, and it takes us to a floor uh, where you can hop into uh, a mini time machine. Why? Because with Future Continuous, you can express future actions in progress. 
how does it work? For example, this way. Of course, it's a mental time machine. It's something that you have to imagine. This time, next week, I'll be having fun in Greece. So what you're doing is, you know, you're, 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 you know, uh, you're thinking about the future, traveling in the future from one place to another, and you're imagining what will be happening, you know, an action in progress. Okay? Good. Um, there's another time machine, a mini time machine, that you can use, which is called Future Perfect. Okay? Let's press this button, and let's see where, where we go. Um, with Future Perfect, it's slightly different than with Future Continuous, because here we won't be looking at a future action in progress. We'll be um, seeing results of a future action, you know, in our little uh, mini time machine. Okay, so for example, by 2016, we will have finished this language course. Now, I'm sorry, I'm not getting into details, structural details of all these tenses, all these future forms. Um, um, I'm assuming that uh, some of you may have heard about them. You know, we don't have time to to uh, to talk in detail about uh, all of these. So. Um, I just want to show you um, a new way of thinking, uh, categorizing uh, and learning the future forms. All right, so uh, there's one more, and actually there are two more, <laughs> because um, there are two floors which we haven't yet visited. To be plus infinitive, let's see what happens if we press this one. Uh, to be plus infinitive um, is usually used uh, to talk about plans and arrangements, uh, but hold on, didn't we talk about it five minutes ago? Plans and arrangements? Uh, yes, we did, but here um, we are um, using formal style, okay? Now, how, how does that differ? Um, imagine a sentence which runs like this, the president is to visit Germany next month, right? So this might appear on the website, official website of the president, or somewhere in the newspaper or in the news, right? Formal style. Uh, we could say the president is going to visit Germany next month, or the president is visiting uh, Germany next month, uh, with little, you know, uh, varieties in um, uh, in in meaning actually. But if this is if this is a plan and arrangement uh, and it's it's a formal style, we don't have to use the sentence uh, the president is visiting Germany next month. We might want to make it a bit more sophisticated, more formal, and use to be plus infinitive. So uh, no future tense, only future forms, twelve of them. Um, most of them, as you can see, are. Uh, ways of talking about the future which um, which somehow rely on grammar on you know the structure of English um, but actually we can also express future with some uh, interesting words uh, let's call them future words all right and let's see uh, what kind of words these are future words such as likely bound and I guess that there are some more examples, but uh, we'll use only these two. Uh, what I mean is situations like these. Unlikely or likely, you know, so something will happen or not. It is rather unlikely that the price of Swiss franc should decrease. Uh, where's, where's grammar in here? There's no grammar, you know, there are only words, you know, and uh, the, the future here is somehow embedded in the word unlikely. And in the second example, uh, the word bound. We are bound to have huge problems in the nearest future, which means that it's very, 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 very probable that we will have these problems. So where's grammar in here? Uh, simple present somewhere, you know, uh, um, before the word bound. But actually, uh, the word which uh, or the structure which expresses the uh, the future tense here is just bound. So uh, uh, it's interesting. You you have to admit. 
Okay, so we're back in the lift and we see uh, the board with the buttons. Do we panic? No, we don't panic. We just think for a moment, you know, which button to choose. Uh, where, where do we want to go? Um, okay, time for a little question from me. Uh, a question to you, okay? Um, think about this situation. In which case does my brother know about my visit? And we have two sentences. I'm going to visit my brother this evening. And the second one, I'm going to visit my brother this evening. So in the first one, we've got uh, um, a present continuous. In the second, going to. Now, could you please use the um, uh, the chat box, you know, the one which you used at the beginning, to uh, to try to give me the right answer? In which case does my brother know about my visit? In situation A or situation B? And... Um, and I'd like to thank you a lot for so many uh, speedy uh, answers here, uh, the vast majority of which point to um, sentence A, uh, which is uh, fixed arrangements, right? This is, this is how you know, we can uh, see that sometimes, actually, um, you know, a little um, structural thing, you know, a little difference between two future forms can make uh, a huge difference. Uh, so uh, you know, so that my brother won't be won't be surprised if I if I visit him. Okay, very good. Well done. Well done, people. Uh, let's move on. Let's move on. Uh, and um, exactly, let's move on to to the huge you know metaphor and the huge question: uh, How many tenses are there in English? Uh, don't worry, we're not going to talk about any more tenses uh, today, but I just want you to think about this metaphor and, you know, all the other uh, structures in English. Um, we've used 12 buttons for the future forms. How about using uh, five additional levels, you know, stories to express the past, uh, the present, etc., etc.? You know, imagine you, you're in a lift. And you just use grammar. You just press the buttons. It's you who who's in control. Okay. I hope you like this metaphor, um, and I hope you you can use it in the future. Right. And now, now let's change the subject. Uh, let's change the subject. Uh, but we're still we're still somewhere in the area of grammar. Okay, uh, I just wanted to share, you, um, uh, share with you a fact uh, which is not commonly known uh, and I'd like to talk to you about gender. Ooh, maybe it's not politically correct to talk about gender, uh, but don't worry, we, we, we're going to talk about grammatical gender. Okay, so it's a safe subject. It's a safe subject. Uh, grammatical gender in English uh, works in an interesting way actually because um, you know in Polish we we have gender uh, you know ten ta to you know feminine masculine neuter uh, finally in English there's uh, uh, there's some gender as well but it's very nicely hidden um, and uh, very often not used but um, but uh, it's good to know that um, there are some things uh, for example, vehicles such as boats, um, ships, even cars, um, which can have uh, a very distinct gender in grammar. Um, so, if you if you have a boat, if you have a boat, and if you know this boat is important for you, you don't have to call it it. What you can do is you can uh, talk about it with the feminine gender. You can say something like, she's my livelihood, you know? Livelihood here meaning uh, the way I earn my money. So, she's my livelihood. We're not talking about a girl, we're not talking about a woman, we're talking about a boat, because boats and ships in English uh, uh, can have the feminine gender. 
It's interesting, isn't it? Uh, it's also interesting that uh, in the same way, uh, in the same emotional way, you can you can you can talk about uh, other vehicles, for example, motorbikes or cars. You know, uh, if you, if you have a Harley Davidson and you really love this bike, you can say something like that. You know, she's great. She's my favorite bike. Um, so. Um, uh, so that's interesting too. Um, about pets, um, it's, it's also uh, it's also good to know that, uh, of course, you know uh, the uh, the common uh, gender that that we combine with pets, uh, like cats and dogs, you know, etc., is is it right? The the, the neuter gender, but. Uh, but um, if you are talking about your favorite pet, your pet, uh, the one that you have at home, etc., of course you can refer to it as a he and uh, or as a she. Right? My 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 cat is is very old. She is uh, 15, for example. Okay, good. So this was the bit about gender, and now um, another subject, another topic. Uh, slightly different, um, but quite useful. Um, quite useful for, for my audience today, uh, which probably uh, uh, in the vast majority uh, 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 combines uh, um, Polish people who, who use English. Uh, this is one of our uh, little uh, problems when we use uh, Past tenses. Uh, it's not. It's not the the most difficult aspect, um, but it's um, it's an interesting one, um, and it's a useful one because you know there's a change of meaning. What am I talking about? I'm thinking about um, a situation such as this. Something that I, as an English teacher, um, uh, hear quite often, and uh, such structures are. Uh, are wrong okay let's see why uh, this is where I was going to school so uh, what kind of tense is used in here uh, past continuous right was going to school and to my ear it's a direct translation from Polish right tutaj chodziłem do szkoły right so um, it's wrong um, no, grammatically um, why is it wrong? Because because past continuous um, is not used for repeated actions, for repeated past actions, right? The, there are some other ways of expressing repeated past actions in in English. Uh, what are they? Well, in in this situation, it would be just fine to say, "This is where I went to school." Okay. It's a difference. This is where I was going to school. This is where I went to school. Uh, of course, you could also use some other forms, such as uh, used to. This is where I used to go to school, etc., uh, etc. Et but I just wanted to show you this little contrast between simple past and past continuous. This is where I went to school. So what about past continuous? It's also a useful tense, isn't it? Yes, it is. Uh, let's imagine a different situation. Uh, you are telling a story, okay? And what you're saying is, for example, this. Hmm, this happened when we were going to school. Me and my friend, and, you know, this is how the story begins. This happened when we were going to school. Past continuous, used appropriately in here, of course, um, uh, but it's not used to talk about a repeated past event. We're telling a story, aren't we? Okay, so a question to you guys, and uh, I'll ask you to use the, the chat box again. Um, and this is my question to you. Are any of these incorrect? Question, uh, actually sentence A, runs like this. This happened when I was sharing my pizza with him. As I took my piece, blah, 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 you know, something happened. And sentence B, I was sharing a flat with him when we were students. My question to you is this, are any of these incorrect? Maybe both are correct. Maybe only one of them is correct, but uh, which one, okay? So, uh, which is incorrect? Maybe they are both correct. Please, think, uh, 
for a few seconds and give me some answers. Okay, so Olga, thank you very much for for your answer. Uh, I'm not telling what it is so far. I'm waiting for some more. Uh, for some more hits. Uh, Ella says that it's both. Uh, somebody says, um, no, uh, actually um, Olga says that B is correct. Uh, Lydia says that both are correct. Uh, only one is correct, says Aneta, and uh, it's confusing, isn't it? Um, but, uh, but not for Kinga, uh, who got it right. So, the official answer is this. Um, it's the second one that uh, was not entirely correct, I think, because this, you know, flat sharing thing, it was a repeated past action, um, at least to my understanding, right? So I think it would be better to say, I shared a flat with him uh, when we were students, uh, just like uh, this is where I went to school, etc., uh, etc. Et and the first one is, is just fine, it's, it's okay, because uh, we're telling a story in here. Okay, very good, well done. Um, let's move on to another aspect. Uh, another aspect, um, also something that uh, is related to grammar, but now uh, it's not about tenses, uh, but about um, another um, scary aspect of English grammar, which some of you uh, might call conditionals, all right? Don't worry, uh, we won't be talking about all the uh, four or five or six conditionals today. We'll just take a look at um, one aspect of the whole problem, which is the word if. Now, um, I guess that many of you uh, have heard this from your teachers. Never use will after if, you know, in the first conditional sentences. And, uh, of course, your teachers were right, but they didn't tell you the whole truth. Uh, I'm going to tell you the whole truth today, all right? Uh, but first, let's, uh, let's see um, uh, the, the part of uh, the truth that, uh, that is usually communicated to students, all right? Let's use a nice example. It's lunchtime, uh, and we have a sentence. Uh, which runs like this. If you join me, I'll buy you a hot dog. Right? If you join me, I'll buy you a hot dog. It's a classic first conditional sentence in which, after if, there is no will. Um, and, you know, in Polish, we have this tendency, actually, um, Polish users of English have this tendency of uh, adding will, you know, after if, which is wrong, of course. Um, so, uh, so this sentence is, is, is a classic sentence, you know, if you join me, I'll buy you a hot dog, it's a conditional, so, you know, if you do one thing, something else will happen, and of course your teachers were 100% were, uh, uh, right to tell you that you can't use will after if. However, there was a bit that they might have uh, uh, kept away from you. Um, and maybe for your own good, because, you know, uh, if you learn English and you're at the pre-intermediate level, it's not good to know everything, you know, you just discover the language bit by bit. So, the fact that they might have uh, kept away from you is that sometimes, in some situations, um, but these are not conditional situations, you can use if after will. For example, if you will come this way, I'll show you your room, okay? So, at first glance, it does look a bit like a first conditional sentence, but it's not. There's no condition in here. Um, what the sentence is about is, is um, you know, it's about request. It's just a polite request. If you will come this way, so, you know, someone invites us, uh, maybe maybe it's a, it's a receptionist or, or you know somebody else. Um, um, if you come if you will come this way, I'll show you your room. Um, it's just a nice polite way of uh, inviting us somewhere, and a way in which will can be absolutely you know correctly used after 
after if. I'll show you one more example of that uh, in, in a few moments. Okay. Actually, uh, I'm going to show it to you now because there's a uh, time for, for a little question for you. Um, and the question might, uh, might be um, a bit similar to the previous one. Are any of these incorrect? So, so any of these incorrect? Question number A. Uh, if you will fill in this form, I'll prepare you a ticket. And sentence B, if you fill in this form, I'll have to divorce you. So my question to you guys is this, are any of these incorrect? Maybe only one is correct, maybe both are correct, maybe both are incorrect. What do you respond? Uh, somebody says that A is correct, somebody says that, that B is incorrect, that both are correct. Uh, let's think about it, folks. Let's think about it. If you will fill in this form, I'll prepare you a ticket. So after if, there is will, right? Will fill. Mm -hmm. And in B, if you fill in this form, I'll have to divorce you. And, uh, you know, I was just... Um, I, um, uh, I just wanted to, you know, uh, face you with such two examples uh, just to give you more uh, um, more um, situations of those you know sentences with if after will um, with will after if sorry uh, so those of you who uh, who decided that both are correct um, and uh, and and who who was this it was Justina for example and uh, it was Gregor and it was Eva and uh, uh, and Aneta and Magda uh, all right, uh, you, you were right. Um, um, why? Uh, let's see. Uh, in A, it's just a request, isn't it? You know, if you will fill in this form, let's translate it into Polish. Gdyby pan zech chciał wypełnić formularz, a ja przygotuję bilet, right? Gdyby pan zech chciał. So there's no condition here. Uh, there is condition in B. If you fill in this form, I'll have to divorce you. Jak wypełnisz ten formularz, to się z tobą rozwiodę. You know? Um, if, you, um, if you can see this difference, uh, uh, then you probably know what this is all about. Okay? Very good. So, let's move on. Um, to a different subject. Um, one of the last for today, I think, um, but it's a subject. It's it's it's, it's something that uh, very often, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, happens in my lessons. You know that uh, my students ask me, uh, Piotr, what's the difference between uh, hundred and hundreds? You know, um, and it's it's actually very easy to explain it. Okay, so let's do it. Uh, hundred and hundreds, or million and millions, thousand and thousands. Um, so let's see how this works. Uh, it works this way. Imagine um, uh, you're uh, uh, you're watching a protest of people, you know, and there are uh, hundreds of people gathered to protest against new government policy, new taxes, uh, or the immigrants, right? And what you say is this: hundreds have gathered to. Uh, protest against new government policy. Uh, instead of hundreds, we could have millions or thousands, etc., etc. Okay. So the way the way you use the word hundreds here is uh, descriptive, right? It's uh, you are not precise, right? You haven't counted all these people. Uh, they just look like you know hundreds of people. Okay. Uh, very good. And uh, with the word hundred, it's a bit different. Uh, have a look at this example. This decision will cost us five hundred dollars. So in here, um, we, we we're not talking about some you know vague, um, uh, uh, descriptive uh, uh, numbers. Here we are we are thinking about uh, you know an exact amount of money five hundred dollars. Okay, uh, does it make sense? Like, you know, thousands of dollars were uh, wasted, but uh, I'm not telling you how much exactly, right? And $500, this is what the decision will cost us. 
All right. So, question to you. Uh, any of these? Incorrect. And sentence A runs like this. 200 people came to see him. Okay. And qu sentence B, we paid him in dollars. He got two hundreds. So, use the chat box, use your keyboards, and please try to uh, provide me with the right answer. Um, which one is incorrect? Or maybe both are correct. You know, could be tricky. But... Uh, but you know better, but you know better, uh, uh, Lydia and Bart and Elżbieta and Monika, uh, you, you remember what I've just said, right? That, uh, uh, that sentence B is uh, incorrect because here we are talking about an exact amount. Um, so uh, we paid him in dollars, he got 200. Okay. Right, very good. So uh, um, you've just revised uh, some nice grammar. You know, maybe maybe it's useful. Maybe uh, maybe it's something that might be uh, used. I don't know, in, in an email or in a uh, contract or uh, just regular conversation. You know, because uh, you know, talking about money is a serious subject, isn't it? And. Um, I'm very sorry to uh, to say, but uh, to say that, but it's it's almost all that I I've got for you today. Uh, frankly speaking, I didn't want to give you too much of you know grammar news. Uh, I wanted you to uh, to process all those facts. And um, uh, good news is that um, um, uh, after the webinar. Um, we'll send you um, a link to a test, to an online test, which uh, you'll be able to, uh, to complete uh, with some automatic feedback. Um, so you'll get the, the results uh, yourselves. It's, it's going to be a short online uh, test in which uh, some of the, the things from the webinar will be revised. So, uh, so I'll, I just hope you... Uh, you get 100% uh, in the test as well. Let's take a look at uh, all the things we, uh, we've we talked uh, about today. Um, we talked about the metaphor uh, for uh, learning future forms, right? Uh, the, the lift, uh, 12 stories. Uh, you remember that, don't you? And then we talked about gender, uh, grammatical gender, of course. Uh, boats, vehicles, you know, they, they, they can be a she in English. And then we talked about past tenses, uh, the, uh, the differences between past simple and past continuous, past continuous for telling stories, and past simple for uh, repeated past actions, all right? I also shared a secret with you um, that actually you can use will after if in certain conditions for very polite requests. And finally, we talked about the, the numerals, the difference between hundred and hundreds. Okay, so uh, that's it. Uh, I hope you can uh, find some time to join our future webinars. And I'd like to thank you a lot for participating in, in this one. Um, and uh, well, what can I say? Thank you. Thank you a lot. And uh, I think uh, now it's time when I uh, give the microphone over to Maciek. He might have some uh, news for you. All right. Dzięki Piotrze. Dziękuję Państwu za udział w naszym webinarium. Ja jeszcze, jeszcze na sam koniec chciałem zaprosić Państwa na nasze kolejne webinaria. Z języka angielskiego to będzie webinarium już październikowe, a z języka niemieckiego to będzie w przyszłym tygodniu we wtorek, 22 września. Dzień później będzie jeszcze webinarium z języka rosyjskiego. Na wszystkie te webinaria serdecznie zapraszamy. Jeżeli mają jakieś Państwo pytania, możecie Państwo teraz zadawać w okienku questions do Piotra a propos naszego dzisiejszego spotkania. Tak jak Piotr przed chwilą jeszcze mówił, niedługo prześlemy do Państwa taki quiz z, z, z kilkoma 
może nie za prostymi pytaniami z dzisiejszego webinarium i nagrania oraz materiały, gdzie będziecie mogli sobie Państwo jeszcze raz na spokojnie przestudiować to, co było poruszone na dzisiejszym webinarium. Widzę, że tu pojawiło się pytanie, więc oddam już głos Piotrowi. Witam ponownie. Teraz już w języku polskim, żeby wszystko było absolutnie jasne. Dziękuję Pani Aniu za, za pytanie i zapraszam jeszcze Państwa oczywiście do zadawania kolejnych. Pani Ania pyta, czy to będzie duży błąd, jeśli ona użyje formy will zamiast going to na przykład. Trudno mi tak od razu odpowiedzieć bez konkretnego przykładu, natomiast to, co, to, co wydaje mi się słuszne, żeby, żeby zapamiętać, to to, że te formy czasu przyszłego, one są do siebie bardzo podobne w wielu sytuacjach i um, chodzi o to, że um, to nie będzie tak jak z past continuous i simple past, że coś będzie brzmiało źle, że tam będzie jakiś zgrzyt taki gramatyczny. Chodzi mi o to, że um, czasami tę samą przyszłość można wyrazić za pomocą y, różnych form czasu przyszłego. No, na przykład... Y, Um, I will learn how to play chess, prawda? I'm going to learn how to play chess. I'm going to learn how to play chess. Te wszystkie, te wszystkie zdania są do siebie podobne. Um, i, I o tym też warto pamiętać, że to nie są jakieś olbrzymie błędy w przypadku czasów przyszłych, prawda? O właśnie, tutaj mam jeszcze kolejne pytanie. Czy jeśli wszędzie będę używał will, to y, będę zrozumiany. Z jednej strony pewnie tak, bo y, ten czasownik will y, no, w angielskim wskazuje na czas przyszły. Prawda? Natomiast y, to jest pytanie o to, y, na ile chcemy brzmieć poprawnie, prawda? Na, na ile zależy nam na jakości y, naszej gramatyki, naszego języka, no bo od czegoś jednak te 12 różnych form po prostu y, jest. Także pewnie z tym mylem byśmy sobie tam dali radę, y, ale warto y, po prostu podróżować pomiędzy tymi, tymi piętrami i wciskać różne przyciski. I jeszcze tutaj mam pytanie od pana Aleksandra, czy używamy if przy second conditional. Oczywiście, że używamy, używamy if przy, przy drugim conditionalu, tylko tam jest troszeczkę inaczej. Teraz nie mamy już na to czasu, ale na pewno if, if jest. Natomiast will już, już znika. Tam, tam jest inne, inne słówko. I tak, tak a propos conditionali, to też taki czasami skrót myślowy, który go używają nauczyciele, żeby nam lepiej to wchodziło do głów, że tam są jakieś czasy, że, że, że tam jest jakiś simple past w trzecim conditionalu, jakiś past perfect. Jedni używają, dla, dla jednych to działa, dla innych słuchaczy to działa, prawda, że taki skrót myślowy, że tam jest tam past perfect, tylko właściwie skąd tam jest past perfect w trzecim conditionalu, prawda, więc y, y, ja bym, jeśli, jeśli wam to nie odpowiada, takie skróty myślowe, prawda, przy conditionalach, że jakiś tam past simple albo past perfect, y, no to moja rada jest taka, bo to nie są czasy przeszłe w conditionalu, prawda, to są po prostu takie formy czasów przeszłych, tego nie trzeba, nie trzeba utożsamiać kondycjonali, na przykład trzeciego nie trzeba utożsamiać z czasami przyszłymi. Jeszcze mam od pani Elżbiety pytanie. Tutaj mamy cytat. You gonna miss me when I'm gone. Czy to jest poprawne? No absolutnie to jest poprawne. You gonna miss me. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna finish, prawda? To są, to są zdania, to są, to są najbardziej poprawne wyrażenia. I'm gonna, to jest po prostu skrót od I'm going to, tak? taki skrót w mówieniu, prawda? W takim, w takim potocznym angielskim, także absolutnie, absolutnie można, można używać tego. So I'm gonna thank you now, and I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna uh, close the webinar. Uh, I hope that uh, we can uh, we can uh, meet in the future uh, soon. Um, and uh, once again, thank you very much for participating.
Bye.